Amazing. So thank you very much for that. So my name is Sammy Taylor. I am a lecturer in forensic science for the University of Greenwich. Um, I also do some consultancy work for a private provider and elsewhere, um, mainly around forensic ecology, so forensic archaeology, etc. So I'm going to talk to you today about a remote field experience um, lecture that we did for our level six students, how we did it, why we did it. I think it's pretty obvious with the pandemic, but just to talk you through some remote experiences that we can give our uh, students with archaeology in particular to see how we can get around the situation that we're in at the moment and also provide some more insight to real archaeology for students whilst at university where we can't always do that. So I'm going to give a little bit of a background as, as to where this has come from. So um, this year we started a brand new module. It's an elective module um, for level six students. It's called Forensic Archaeology and Anthropology. It's brand new. Um, in previous years, they have done a little bit of forensic anthropology within their forensic identification module in level six. But these students that have just come up into level six have never touched archaeology or anthropology before. It's only a 15 credit module. So I only had between the end of September and the beginning of December to give them all of this information. And if you have any knowledge on archaeology and anthropology, it's such a wide spectrum. It's huge. It could probably be taught over an entire degree, masters. So it's a lot to get all in one module, especially for a 15 credit module. So that was something that we had to consider from the get go. I designed this module about two years ago. So it's fantastic that it came about this September, but also not so fantastic with the environment that we're in at the moment and not knowing what's going on. So there was lots of logistical planning that went into this. Um, as you all know, getting any kind of experience in forensic science is like gold dust for obvious reasons, especially in forensic archaeology and anthropology. So how do you give the students that hands on experience in both of these fields? So in anthropology, um, universities mainly rely on the Human Tissue Act or archaeological remains in order to give them hands-on experience with that in a laboratory setting and in archaeology we largely rely on sparse open areas um, and we can't really get them on other sites elsewhere and relying on these open areas and places has a huge financial cost and as I've learned a huge sustainability implication so it's quite hard to put these things into practice. We've had Loads of logistical issues with the global pandemic with people coming in online because they're having to isolate. So there's ways in which we're having to provide this information as is or as are everybody else within the forensic community trying to provide this online and live at the same time. And with archaeology and anthropology, if you're not doing it hands on, it's very, very difficult to um, put across. So we've kind of implemented various things in order to help with this module. I managed to get an annual licence from the University for Complete Anatomy 3D for all students and staff. I don't know if anyone has used Complete Anatomy 3D. I can't compliment it enough. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's an online app which gives you 3D visuals of the entire human body. So you can go from flesh straight, straight down to skeletonized and they can do male and female as well. And you can kind of pick it to layer by layer. You can even have the heart beating as well to show how that works and that interacts. So we've been using that online. The students also get their own license with that as well. So they can have that on their phones, laptops, iPads, whatever device they have. So they can interact with us both online and live themselves to see what we're talking about. I found that in the pandemic, when we were doing the um, forensic identification section of the anthropology, that this was really, really helpful because we were predominantly online at that point we had no face-to-face -face lectures that was really really helpful um we have incorporated it this year when we're face-to-face -face so that we can utilize that for people in class and at home at the same time i've also used something called sketchfab another fantastic resource i've put a link here terry simmons she put some fantastic 3d resources of human and non-human remains which I can access, the students can access, you can manipulate them in real time as well. So I've been utilising that within lectures at the moment. So again, online and face-to-face -face students can get the same interaction. With anthropology, it's taught by a cert, uh, certified forensic anthropologist, which is luckily my husband, but my colleague Luke, um, and we use Bone Clones. So Bone Clones are a company that give um, rendered models, basically, 
um, of skeletal remains. So they come and they've got the pathologies, the traumas, all of the characteristics that we need. The downside is that is needed face to face. We can't give that online. So for the students that are online and that can't come in in person, we use complete anatomy and sketch fab. And for those that are in person, they can utilise those physical 3D um, pieces of equipment. So it's trying to be able to interact with students online and in person and give them the same experience. So with anthropology, I wouldn't say it's been easy, but with these fantastic resources, we have been able to successfully do that. Archaeology is a little bit different. Um, so archaeology is brand new, like I said, for this module. We've had to go through quite a rigorous health and safety, sustainability um, protocol in order to get this in place. But we managed to gather a one acre area of land. It's on a completely separate um, campus. And that one acre land is now ours completely. And we utilize it for mass graves or clandestine graves. We've only done it once this year. It, required the biggest logistical planning I think I've ever been part of. It paid off in the end, it was fantastic, but it meant that there was lots of financial implications in there. We had to get transport for all the students to get there. Um, we had to have burials enough for 40 students. That's quite a lot of students to get into a clandestine burial. So we had around 22 um, two foot clandestine burials. Timetabling was quite difficult as well because we needed it for a whole day. Um, and because of all of this planning and the issues we had going forward with this, and sometimes up to a week before we did it, um, a few of their archaeology labs got cancelled. So we did originally have a stratigraphy lab. Um, so looking at the formation of layers in soil, that got cancelled prior to this. So they lost out on that, and that was due to timetabling issues. So I was trying to think, how do I do these lectures and give them practical archaeology experience? So they did manage to do this clandestine burial that was right at the end of term. For whatever reasons that happened, I won't go into it. This did not happen until the last week of term. It was very cold. I'm not sure the students loved me for it, um, but it did go down really well. But it meant that out of the archaeology and anthropology, they only had one archaeology practical and when I looked at the learning outcomes I thought this isn't enough they need to do something more in order to understand why those lectures are important and put them into practice. Luckily I got called upon to go on to a deployment with Geoscope Services so Geoscope Services um, they're a company that basically derive um, from a geophysics background but they also offer topographical service for archaeology, for forensics and domestic services as well. Um, they are working with a American governmental organisation at the moment, whereby they are going out on deployments to repatriate those that are missing in action from World War II. Um, the great thing about Geoscope is it's not your conventional company, so they don't have loads of full time staff. They have a bank of people, of volunteers from loads of different expertise that they call upon and then we can go out on these deployments and all work together. I'll touch on who's kind of there and what they do in a second but the end of October um, myself and Luke got called out to help with this. Um, being in the middle of the teaching term I thought oh no I can't go but then something clicked and I thought actually if I can incorporate this within the module so that the students benefit from this, maybe I could go. So I spoke to the company's director, who's a very good friend of mine. And because this isn't under any kind of NDA or confidential agreement, um, I was able to share what we were doing. So I sat with the director and said, do you think that we could give some kind of live interactive session on the site whilst I'm there? He was really great and agreed to this. And in fact, the whole site agreed to it, whereby the majority of the people on site ended up giving a talk at the same time. So I had a great bunch of people all very willing to give the students something completely unique. Um, it was kind of done at the drop of a hat. So it was all organized within about a day, done the next day. I had no idea how it was gonna pan out. Um, so I went to France and what we were doing was, like I said, looking for those missing in action from World War II. Uh, magnetometry allowed us to locate the aircraft that we were looking for. We were looking for a B-24J Liberator and we were looking for two American personnel, the tail gunner 
and the navigator. So we knew where the aircraft was. And this aircraft was in this region because in World War II, this was a secret logistic um, mission. So the Americans had left from the UK and they were going over to the French Germany border to drop some resources to the French resistance. However, it was clandestine. So they were asked to keep their radio transmissions, their lights off. Because of that, there was some American interception from the ground and they were trying to get hold of the aircraft. The radio was off, so they couldn't, and they got shot down by friendly fire. Um, there were eight people on board, four people died, and we had two completely missing in action, which was the tail gunner and navigator. So the sole purpose for us being there was to one, locate the aircraft and determine if any remains that we found or material evidence that was associated um, with the unaccounted individuals were present at site. So it was still archaeological and it still had the potential for human remains etc we were very aware of the ethics that was going on so we did this quite early on the lecture was done at the end of october in the second week of the excavation it was going quite slow at the time and we knew that well we kind of guessed and hoped that we wouldn't come across anything um human in the remote lecture that we gave us to not cause any distress and luckily that didn't happen at the time so as i said it was kind of a, a touch and go thing we did not know what we was doing quite at the time we were just hoping for the best um it did end up really well in the end but yeah it was a bit like this it was live we didn't know what was going to happen it could have anything could have happened um so it was a three hour interactive lecture um, again, we didn't think we were going to take three hours, but we did take the full three hours. So it was done via Microsoft Teams, but we had loads of different resources going on at the same time. I had Luke, who's with us in the audience today, on a different laptop so that he could open materials. We actually had materials um, of anti-mortem information from the people we were looking for. So we had dental records and some things like that that we were allowed to show the students. So as the director and I were talking, Luke could then implement and show the students what we were talking about at the same time against the lecture slides. We also have had another video going so that they could see some of the associated evidence that had already been retrieved. So they're looking at grenades and things like that. So there was lots going on all at one time and it was an active archeological site. Uh, we were in a mess tent, so there was loads of things going on behind us, lots of distractions, but the students absolutely loved it. And it was, I got a lot more questions that I thought I was gonna get. I think you're all probably in the same notion that lots of people have got teams fatigue at the moment. So I didn't know if I was gonna get great engagement, but we did, we had lots of fantastic questions. So the presentation was just about the site itself, the company, the purpose of why we were there, talking about the logistics of an entire site like we were on and the exhibits and how the exhibits are handled and probative versus non-probative, aircraft material, what we do with those exhibits, where they go at the end of it. So there was lots of questioning regarding that. After we'd given them all the theory, if you like, we took them on a guided tour of the site. And like I said, it was active and we were really, really worried that something might pop up at a time which we didn't really want it to. Um, so we took them out with a DJI Osmo mobile. It's just a little gimbal that attaches to a mobile phone. So one person was sitting on Teams on one end and the rest of us took this gimbal around on site. And we did not stop the archaeological excavation. So there was lots going on. There was people dry sieving, wet sieving, um, excavating. And as we went around, everybody said something to the camera. So we had a senior archaeologist there that went through step by step what the excavation was and was talking through the stratigraphy, even had a like a, a little pointer, it wasn't a laser pointer, but a, a pointer to show them the burning action and why that had happened. And the students were asking questions as to why the soil looked like that. And he was able to show them in real time what had happened. We just came across an engine bay as well, which the students were able to see. So lots of questioning about that and why things look the way they were. I think it was really interesting for students to see the scale of it as well. When we show them pictures online in a lecture, obviously it's not to scale and they don't quite understand how big an excavation can be and the problems that can occur from an excavation. Where we were, it was just limestone. It was really thick limestone. It was really hard to dig and they could see that because the people were digging at the time. So that was great. We had forensic anthropologists there. We had people from UK DVI 
we also had World War II experts who did a fantastic talk on some of the evidence that we found, where it had come from, how it would come about in the area that it was in, and what they would do with that piece as well. So that was really interesting. So three hours of just talking, running around the site, showing how it works. So going from the excavation to the dry sieve and maybe some more clay items going through the wet sieve, how the wet sieve worked, why it worked in that way and why we were doing it in that way. I am sorry, I am from Essex, so I sometimes do supersonic speed. I feel like I'm doing that, so I do apologise. So they did that for three hours. Um, but what was the point in doing that? So beforehand, they had a three hour lecture with me on stratigraphy, so the formation of layers. If anybody has done anything like that before, I think you might tell me that it's quite dull. In fact, the students did tell me that it was a very dull lecture. So how was I gonna make that more exciting for them? I hope the live lecture did that. It put it into practice as to why we did that in the way that we did it. So they could see the stratigraphy, they could see why we look at layers, how important it is to do things in arbitrary layers and why we're doing it in that way. So they could visualize something that was real against the lecture that we'd done previously. So what was the point in them do doing that as well if they weren't gonna get a follow up because they weren't on site themselves? I gave them a follow up as soon as I was allowed to. So once the excavation had finished, the company director gave us all a, three, a great 3D imagery um, that I could send to the students. So I have got a link on here if you want to play about with it. Um, these images on here are the 3D images of the site itself. This was all done using photogrammetry. It was done with a DJI Phantom 4, so a drone that 3D mapped the whole area. And now you're able to go on and manipulate that and have a look at that a look at that in all dimensions and as you can see from the image it's clear to see the different contexts you can see the different areas of where the engines were right in the middle where you see that layer of water that was the fuselage and you can kind of see which direction the aircraft hit as well so although the students got this lecture on the second week of the excavation i was then able to give them a real visual of what it looked like at the end and it was a it was good for them because they were able to then picture why we did things in the way that we did them it may have seemed mundane to start with um, and a logistical nightmare for us but we had to do it in this way in order to get this result and it was really important for them to see why we'd done it like that so they'd learned that in the live lecture and now they're able to see the importance of why we'd done it and the fact that it was real life um, and it was done in real time, I think really helped them to engage from the information prior and after. Um, also after that, the great thing was because we had loads of fantastic questions from students, the company director was really, really impressed with some of the questions we got and actually offered to come in for a few sessions thereafter. So we did a huge scattered remains practical as part of this module. Um, himself and a few other colleagues came along free of charge just to come and speak to the students. A lot of them were asking them questions not only about this site, but about work opportunities, etc. It allowed for great networking for the students and it, it allowed the students to meet the people that they were talking to online. And I had some really great feedback on that. So this is just some um, feedback from the students that I had from the module reviews. I'd like to say it really went well. I was really nervous about it because we were in a very remote area in France. I had no idea if the Wi-Fi was going to hold up. I told the students about this. They were all quite excited. I was really worried that I was going to let them down. It all held up really well. It went a lot better than I had originally hoped. And I got some fantastic feedback. I think the downside now is that I'm going to have to try and do something similar every year. But things like this don't always come up in the appropriate time. So now I'm kind of beating myself up a little bit because I don't quite know what to do next year if something isn't similar for the students coming in um, in September. But that's something that I'll have to figure out at the time. So just some more feedback they loved the practical elements um, and they were able to put into practice what they learned and I think we could all agree that that's the most important part and with archaeology especially in a 15 credit module at undergraduate level it's very difficult to try and put in all of that theory into practice in one go so I think from the feedback I can say it worked um yeah so I don't know how long I've spoke for. I'm really sorry. If you've got any questions, you can. There's a link here. If you want to go and watch the
the entire lecture. Geoscope have put the entire lecture on their YouTube. I do apologise for even more talking on that, um, but it's really great to see all of the other uh, experts discussing their fields. And if you want to email me, you're more than welcome. I think I can breathe now. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. That was absolutely fabulous. What a phenomenal thing. I would love to have done that as a student uh, myself. Uh, I'd already found your YouTube channel and watched it. It's great to see you, you and uh, your colleague in your kind of raw capped status walking around the field. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, uh, feel free to stick them in the bottom. Uh, Rachel's asked, um, so I'll read out the quote in case you can't see it. So she loves the approach like I guess we all, we all do uh, and she would love to be able to replicate something similar. Uh, her um, field is firearm investigation in case you didn't know. So her, her question is about the concern she thinks practitioners may have in in the area, you know, in, in terms of sharing visible case sensitive content. So perhaps you can talk a little bit about how you address that kind of concern um, and then talk about if you know anything about how you could do a kind of simulated or office based version of something that is similar to the experience you just talked about there? Yeah it's a really good question and we were quite lucky in this respect because it wasn't casework um, and there was no NDA to be signed and we the company allowed us to share all the information we were doing in real time so we were actually sharing pictures and information on LinkedIn as well as we were going through to gain traction so we were allowed to share anything we wanted uh, within reason. We weren't allowed to share human remains, of course, but it that allowed us to pretty much have full reign and do what we wanted to do. And I appreciate that with casework, that's going to be pretty much impossible. So I think from an archaeological perspective, it would work if you can get on sites that don't have those NDA requirements. I think lab based, if you could get hold of somebody that has um, some kind of evidence that you don't see casework related information to. Um, maybe you could do something with those. I don't know. It might be worth contacting some of the companies to see if you could um, show them real time evidence, but not tell them what it's about. Um, I, I don't know how that would work in real time and, and the logistics against confidentiality. But my motto always is if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, so, yeah, I think this is very unique in the fact that I had this opportunity to give this to the students. Um, but I do appreciate that with forensic casework, this is going to be pretty impossible. I think you could probably implement um, some crime scene information online. So using Google Maps, I know that somebody did a great talk on utilising Google Maps for online crime scene reconstruction. So maybe utilising your experience and putting that in without telling them any kind of backstory. Um, other than that, I, I think I was just lucky. <laughs> uh, I don't think you were lucky. I think you designed a really good um, uh, module there. Um, so a question for me, I'm really interested in the kind of the contextual learning. So what went around the lecture, which is clearly excellent, I guess I was specifically asking, did you notice anything in terms of how students achieved in the module in terms of, you know, assessments, interest in the discipline or field uh, akin to what you've seen in other similar experiences when you haven't used a live lecture? Yeah, so um, we've we've had great engagement, I think, from the beginning of the module because it's brand new. Um, and for whatever reason, anthropology and archaeology seems quite sexy. So we had some quite good engagement from the beginning. But with the archaeology, as I said in 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 the lecture, they get quite bored when you're just talking to them about soil types and things like that. And I could see them drifting um, within the second archaeological lecture. I definitely saw attendance drop because they just didn't want to know, really. And sometimes with stratigraphy, I can kind of understand that. So I started seeing engagement drop with archaeology lectures. So I was a bit worried about this lecture, thinking that nobody was going to turn up because they would associate it with those. Um, however, once they had attended this lecture, they were able to realise why that was so important. And actually, as dull as soil types might be, when they can put that then in a forensic context, they understand the importance. So when they came along to do the clandestine excavation, so the week before term ended, 
I could see that when they were excavating, they started talking to one another and say, OK, I can see a soil change here. Does that mean that the stratigraphy has changed? Why is that? And they started questioning themselves and others. So I started them seeing them really understand why things were important and the importance of them. And they kind of started getting excited. I think with everything else, once they can put that into practice and they understand why they've learned it, it makes them far more excited to then carry on. They're... Um, I can't talk much about grades at the moment. We're marking their witness report. So some are absolutely fantastic, um, but their other assessment was a practical human skeleton um, biological profile. So it didn't have huge contribution as to what we did for this lecture. But yeah, I can't talk about the other assessment just yet as I haven't given any marks or any feedback yet in case any of the students are watching. <laughs>